a glorious day to all. I hope everyone is healthy and safe. Today, we are going to talk about the school age group that's 6 to 11 years old. All of the texts in this lecture are lifted from the latest edition of Nelson's textbook of pediatrics. The middle childhood, that's 6 to 11 years of age, is the period in which children increasingly separate from parents. Why? Because now, they spend most of their time in school. Hence, aside from their parents, they seek acceptance from teachers, other adults, and peers. Children begin to feel under pressure to conform to the style and ideals of the peer group. For every age group, there will always be a central issue. And for this group, the middle childhood, it will always be self-esteem. This self-esteem becomes a central issue as children develop the cognitive ability to consider their own self-evaluations and their perception of how others see them. For the first time, they are judged according to their ability to produce socially valued outputs such as getting good grades, playing a musical instrument, or maybe hitting home runs. Now let's start with the first aspect, that's your physical development. Growth occurs discontinuously in three to six irregularly timed spurts each year, but varies among individuals. Growth during the period averages to 3 to 3.5 kilograms and 6 to 7 centimeters per year. The head grows only 2 centimeters in circumference throughout the entire period, reflecting a slowing of brain growth. Myelinization continues into adolescence, however, with peak gray matter at 12 to 14 years. Body habitus is more erect than previously, with long legs compared with the torso. Growth of the mid-face and lower face occurs gradually. Loss of your deciduous or your baby teeth is a more dramatic sign of maturation, beginning around 6 years of age. Replacement with adult teeth occurs at a rate of about 4 per year, so that by age 9 years, children will have 8 permanent incisors and 4 permanent molars. Premolars erupt by 11 to 12 years of age. Lymphoid tissues hypertrophy, often giving rise to impressive tonsils and adenoids. Muscular strength, coordination, and stamina increase progressively as does the ability to perform complex movements, such as dancing or even playing basketball or cricket. Such higher-order motor skills are the result of both maturation and training. The degree of accomplishment reflects wide variability in innate skill, interest, and opportunity. However, the downside of this all is that physical fitness has declined among school-aged children. Sedentary habits at this age are associated with increased lifetime risk of obesity, cardiovascular disease, academic achievement, and lower self-esteem. One quarter of youth do not engage in any free time physical activity despite the recommendation for one hour of physical activity per day. Perceptions of body image develop early during this period. Children as young as 5 and 6 years express dissatisfaction with their body image. By ages 8 and 9 years, many of these youth report trying to diet, often using ill-advised regimens. Loss of control or binge eating occurs among approximately 6% of children of this age. Prior to puberty, the sensitivity of the hypothalamus and the pituitary changes, leading to increased gonadotropin synthesis. Interest in gender differences and sexual behavior increases progressively until puberty. Although this is a period when sexual drives are limited, masturbation is common and children may be interested in differences between genders. So I don't know if you can still remember during your time, maybe this was the first time you had your first crush, so it was normal. 
for that age group or for that matter, your age group. So what does it tell us, the parents and you as future pediatricians, is that middle childhood is generally a time of excellent health. Children of this age compare themselves with others, eliciting feelings about their physical attributes and abilities. Fears of being abnormal can lead to avoidance of situations. Children with actual physical disabilities may face special stresses. Medical, social, and psychological risks tend to occur together. Children should be asked about risk factors for obesity, participation in physical activity including organized sports, or other organized activities can foster skill, teamwork, and fitness as well as a sense of accomplishment. But pressure to compete when the activity is no longer enjoyable has negative effects. Counseling on establishing healthy eating habits and limited screen time should be given to all families. Pre-pubertal children should not engage in high-stress, high-impact sports such as powerlifting or tackle football because skeletal immaturity increases the risk of injury. Now let's go to cognitive development. The thinking of early elementary school age children differs qualitatively from that of preschool children in place of magical, egocentric, and perception-bound cognition, school age children increasingly apply rules based on observable phenomena, factor in multiple dimensions, and points of view, and interpret their perceptions using physical laws. There is a Swiss psychologist by the name of John Piaget who documented this shift from pre-operational to concrete logical operations. So when five-year-olds watch a ball of clay being rolled into a snake, they might insist that that snake has more because it is longer. In contrast, seven-year-olds typically reply that the ball and the snake must weigh the same because nothing has been added or taken away or because the snake is both longer and thinner. This cognitive reorganization occurs at different rates in different contexts. In the context of social interactions with siblings, young children often demonstrate an ability to understand alternate points of view long before they demonstrate that ability in their thinking about the physical world. Understanding time and space constructs occurs in the later part of this period. The concept of school readiness has evolved. School makes increasing cognitive demands on the child. Mastery of the elementary curriculum requires that a large number of perceptual, cognitive, and language processes work efficiently and children are expected to attend to many inputs at once. The first two to three years of elementary school are devoted to acquiring the fundamentals, reading, writing, and basic mathematics skills. By third grade, children need to be able to sustain attention through a 45-minute period and the curriculum requires more complex tasks. The goal of reading a paragraph is no longer to decode the words, but to understand the content. The goal of writing is no longer spelling or penmanship, but composition. The volume of work increases along with the complexity. Children's intellectual activity extends beyond the classroom, so beginning in the third or fourth grade, children increasingly enjoy strategy games and word play that exercise their growing cognitive and linguistic mastery. Many become experts on subjects of their own choosing, such as sports trivia, or develop hobbies, such as special card collections. Others become avid readers or take an artistic pursuits. Whereas board and card games were once the usual leisure time activity of youth, video, computer, and other electronic games currently fill this need. So, what does it say? What does it imply for parents and pediatricians? Pediatricians have an important role in preparing their patients for school entrance by promoting health through immunizations, 
adequate nutrition, appropriate recreation, and screening for physical, developmental, and cognitive disorders. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that pediatric providers promote the five R's of early education. Reading as a daily family activity, rhyming, playing and cuddling together, routines and regular times for meals, play and sleep, reward through praise for successes, and reciprocal nurturing relationships. Concrete operations allow children to understand simple explanations for illnesses and necessary treatments, although they may revert to pre-logical thinking when under stress. A child with pneumonia may be able to explain about white cells fighting the germs in the lungs, but still secretly harbors the belief that the sickness is a punishment for disobedience. As children are faced with more abstract concepts, academic and classroom behavior problems emerge and come to the pediatrician's attention. So this will be the time wherein referrals for deficits in perception, specific learning disabilities, global cognitive delay, primary attention deficit, and attention deficit secondary to family dysfunction, depression, anxiety, or chronic illness are discovered. Children whose learning style does not fit the classroom culture may have academic difficulties and need assessment before failure sets in. Simply having a child repeat a failed grade rarely has any beneficial effect and often seriously undercuts the child's self-esteem. In addition to finding the problem areas, identify also each child's strength is very important. So educational approaches that value a wide range of talents, those with multiple intelligence, beyond the traditional ones of reading, writing, and mathematics, may allow more children to succeed. Now, let's go to social and emotional development. In this period, energy is directed toward creativity and productivity. Changes occur in three spheres, the home, the school, and the neighborhood. Of this, the home and family remain the most influential. Can you still remember the time when you asked permission to sleep over at a friend's house and the first time at overnight camp? That was a sign of increasing independence and is normal at this age group. This is at this time when parents should make demands for effort in school and extracurricular activities, celebrate successes, and offer unconditional acceptance when failures occur. Regular chores associated with allowance provide an opportunity for children to contribute to family functioning and learn the value of money. These responsibilities may be a testing ground for psychological separation, leading to conflict. Siblings have critical roles as competitors, loyal supporters, and role models. The beginning of school coincides with a child's further separation from the family and the increasing importance of teacher and peer relationships. Social groups tend to be same-sex, with frequent changing of membership contributing to a child's growing social development and competence. So this is a group wherein you have all-girls group or all-boys group, and that popularity is a central ingredient of self-esteem. And this may be won through possessions, like having the latest electronic gadgets or the right clothes, as well as to personal attractiveness, like he's very popular because he's the most handsome in school or she's popular because she's the prettiest girl in the classroom or by accomplishments like always will have a 90 grade in school gets perfect every time there's a quiz or always wins the singing or the dancing contest or that person is popular by just having actual social skills do you have a friend that can just hop from one group to another, can blend in with, with any other group, or just like the best friend of everyone? So those are the gifted 
overly friendly guys who can just like join any group if they want to. So some children, they conform readily to the peer norms and enjoy easy social success. But those who adopt individualistic styles or have visible differences may be teased. So such children may be painfully aware that they are different or they may be puzzled by their lack of popularity. So children with deficits in social skills may go to extreme lengths to win acceptance only to meet with repeated failure. So we have a lot of movies like that. Attributions conferred by peers such as funny or you're stupid, you're bad, you're fat may become incorporated into a child's self-image and affect the child's personality as well as school performance. Parents may have their greatest effect indirectly through actions that change the peer group. For example, moving to a new community or insisting on involvement in structured after-school activities. So in the neighborhood, real dangers such as busy streets, bullies, and strangers tax school-age children's common sense and resourcefulness. Ever heard of those street smart kids? They're the ones always exposed to the dangers of the neighborhood. So media exposure at this time to adult materialism, sexuality, substance use, and violence may be frightening, reinforcing children's feeling of powerlessness in the larger world. That's why Compensatory fantasies of being powerful may fuel the fascination with heroes and superheroes. A balance between fantasy and an appropriate ability to negotiate real-world challenges indicates healthy emotional and development. So at this age group, when you hear a child saying, Oh, I want to be Superman because I want to help those who are in distress. Or I want to, see, I want to be Invisible Man because... I want to surprise all those bad guys. So that's normal for this age group. These are compensatory fantasies. Now let's go to the last one. That's your moral development. Although by age 6 years, most children will have a conscience, they vary greatly in their level of moral development. For the younger youth, many still subscribe to the notion that rules are established and enforced by an authority figure like a parent or a teacher. And decision-making is guided by self-interest, like avoidance of negative and the receipt or of positive consequences. The needs of others are not strongly considered in decision-making. But as they grow older, most will recognize not only their own needs and desires, but also those of others although personal consequences are still the primary driver of behavior. Social behaviors that are socially undesirable are considered to be wrong. By age 10 to 11 years, the combination of peer pressure, a desire to please authority figures, as well as an understanding of reciprocity, treat others as you wish to be treated, shapes the child's behavior. So its implications to parents and pediatricians is that children need unconditional support as well as realistic demands as they venture into a world that is often frightening. A daily query from parents over the dinner table or at bedtime about the good and bad things that happened during the child's day may uncover problems early. Parents may have difficulty allowing the child independence or may exert excessive pressure on their children to achieve academic or competitive success. Children who struggle to meet such expectations may have behavior problems or psychosomatic complaints. Many children face stressors that exceed the normal challenges of separation and success in school and the neighborhood. Divorce affects nearly 50% of children. Domestic violence, parental substance abuse, and other mental health problems may also impair a child's ability to use home as a source base or a secure base for refueling emotional energies. In many neighborhoods, random violence makes the normal development of independence extremely dangerous. 
Older children may join gangs as a means of self-protection and a way to attain recognition and belong to a cohesive group. Children who bully others and or are victims of bullying should be evaluated since this behavior is associated with mood disorders, family problems, and school adjustment problems. Parents should reduce exposure to hazards when possible. So, because of the risk of unintentional firearm injuries to children, parents should be encouraged to ask the parents of the playmates whether a gun is kept in their home and if so, how is it secured. So, at this time, pediatrician visits are infrequent in this period. Therefore, each visit is an opportunity to assess the children's functioning in all contexts, home, school, and the neighborhood. So, due to continuous exposure and the strong influence of media programming and advertisements on children's beliefs and attitudes, parents must be alert to exposures from the television and internet. Parents should be advised to remove the television from their children's rooms and limit viewing to two hours per day and monitor what programs children watch. So that's it. And so with this slide, I end my lecture reminding you to stay home in these times, wear a mask or a face shield, and always wash your hands. Good day, everyone.